Sarai Barryman, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thank you for having me. I'm apprehensively excited. <laughs> <laughs> be apprehensively excited. Just be excited. That's okay. good. It's good. I'm excited. Excellent. I'm excited. I'm so proud of you guys and what you've done with this podcast. So I'm pumped to be on here. I'm honoured. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, we're excited to have you in the Export Beer Garden studio. Growing up in West Auckland, you must have had a few garage parties with the Export Guards <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> a fair few. I have to say I'm not a beer drinker, but uh, in those olden days, yeah. you drank whatever was put in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> so there was Export. I think there was Lion Red. We had DB. I mean, whatever. Yeah. Whatever was going. A few, few KGBs, a few, few tattoos. A few KGBs, yeah, yeah. tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> tattoos, I forgot about those. A little snake, was it a snake bite as well? Was that a little the one in the green in the green bottle? Was it called a snake bite? No, that's the tattoo. It's oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, It's got like sorry, the black kind of lizard dragon thingy I've on I've been it. out of the game for so long, oh. guys, <laughs> and I don't, I don't know the alcoholic drinks anymore. <laughs> which it. comes as a surprise to you, Sarai. I'm shocked. Uh, I can't believe it, actually. Yeah. I want to talk a bit more about this. So what led to this decision? Oh, you might have seen me on a beers on a few occasions oh, back, a back in the day, and it just wasn't serving me anymore. Really? It, yeah. Oh, the, the hangovers were getting too much. The conversations in my head that no one else could hear were just getting too much. And yeah, Stephen helped me one day, said, man, you're out of everybody I know, you're probably the one that doesn't need alcohol to fit into a social situation. Yeah. And he was right. That's and I, true. Yeah. And I... From that moment, made a decision and I was out. So the man. Between Two Beers name is a bit of a gimmick yeah, name Yeah, man. Now. How the fuck can you do this podcast and not be a drinker anymore? <sighs> yeah, no, I just, I just muddle, muddle, muddle my way through. Stephen has the two beers. Um, yeah, I do the drinking. On, on my behalf. Okay. On behalf. Unless it's an early, early well, morning I might have record. a beer with you today just to oh, yeah. Yeah, there you make go. up. But you know what? Solid. Thank you. Solid. Fucking good on you, man. Thank you. I'm I appreciate proud of you. it. I'm Thank proud you of very you. much. Um, I must say as well that my mum, Jen, sends her regards. We've done nearly 140 plus episodes, and I don't think she's ever been so excited that when I told her that we were <laughs> going to speak to you, that you were coming on. So you met in Papua New Guinea, Jen. my beautiful mum, Jen. Yep. Um, so she sends her very, very best. Oh, I love Jen. Jen and I are like two peas in a pod. I feel like all the things that Jen loves, I love. And I know in, my, in Seamus's life, if Jen approves of something then it's totally okay and it's above board and apparently she's on board with uh, Seamus's uh, oh. new, uh, <laughs> uh, new, new love interest new in love Shay's interest life in Shay's I life. love so, where this know, is going oh, Sarai's come this. to play huh? <laughs> <laughs> so she's, come to, she's come to play uh, yeah Doc Brown she's she's very uh, she's very happy with Doc Brown so things yeah. are going well in that regard yeah I'm excited to meet her yeah and uh, yeah well, see, could, see what who is it that has taken Seamus mm. Martin off the market tamed the world mate. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Well, this, <laughs> this episode is not this episode is not <laughs> about me. That's no, good. It's good. Uh, we're recording this on the afternoon of the Eden Park semi final, um, mm. but I wanted to start pre tournament. Okay. So I think they call it match day minus one. Is that right, Shay? Is that the, the terminology? Correct. Yeah, that's yeah. competitions lingo. Um, I saw Sir. I saw you at the OFC Congress. You gave me a big hug. I hadn't yeah. seen you for a long time, and I said, "How are you?" And Sir, I said, "I am super stressed." Yeah. What is there to be stressed about match day minus one of a FIFA Women's World Cup in your home country? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, where do I start? Um, it's just so much has been building up to that moment and you just you feel an immense pressure at that point in time because you don't know what's coming. You don't know how it's going to be received. You've planned and strategized and every single possibility plan a plan b plan c all the contingencies are there everyone's ready but somehow in that moment you're it's it's terrifying because you're ahead of it i don't know it's like is is it a bl is are those moments like a blur like i, I think back to that it's a room full of people you're yeah. greeting everyone you're probably excited because you yeah. haven't seen people for a long yes. time but is it is it that kind of just a blur of go is, going through the motions? It is a bit going through the motions. One thing that I've been trying to do and really make a conscious effort to do during this World Cup is is stop and take in moments instead of just blurring through them and rushing on to the next thing and always being on my phone and just actually just sit in the moment. I've had to consciously do that because if you don't, 
consciously do it, you end up just getting sucked into the thing and yeah, before you know it, it's over and you know, it it is a big blur. So yeah, I've tried to take in moments, um, but it's immense. It's 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 a freaking beast. Like the level of detail of stuff that I have had to deal with in the last twelve months is beyond anything that I ever imagined I would be thinking about, talking about, deciding about. It's just, it's nuts. And my retention for information now is so low and so short because my brain is just so full of like, how many seat cushion covers should there be (laughs) in the VIP in Eden Park? And, you know, how many, what colour should the table things be inside the lounge and ah how many bibs do we need for it's just like this immense level of detail which is yeah involved in an event of this magnitude i mean you know it you've been involved yeah not to this level this is a big big beast like you said on that day before match day one like, do you have actual jobs and responsibility? Like, is everything in order at that point? Yeah. Like, are you, are you doing a speech at Congress that night? Is that kind of on your radar? Is yeah, so no, it's, I mean, by that point, like, operationally, we, we're set to go. We're good to go. Like, there's not really anything else but kind of busy work to kind of keep people occupied before kickoff. Um, but, yeah, if you don't have it done by then... You're fucked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also imagine in all your contingencies, unfortunately, the situation that unfolded on the morning oh, of the match bro. day wasn't Honestly. on the horizon. No. And, and for those that don't know, we're talking about the shooting in downtown oh. Auckland on Queen Street, which Nuts. was on the morning of that match in yeah. New Zealand versus Norway. Yeah, that was oh, that was unbelievable. Yeah. And where, where we're staying with the FIFA hotel, it's like a block away. And what woke me up was actually the police helicopter. It was the police helicopter flying up above the area that woke me up. I was like, ugh, this is so annoying. I wanted to sleep in today. What is this? My transport is early. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, mate, I wish. (laughs) No, but, yeah, it was, I I thought it was a, I thought it was a joke. I couldn't believe it. So I looked out the window, I saw the helicopter, I was like, what's this? Turn on the TV, breaking news, I couldn't believe it. And that morning, we had TVNZ set up to broadcast the morning show from the fan zone, which was directly Mm. where the shooting was, you know, in the cloud. And they were like on the spot reporting, they just happened to be there. And it was like, it was unbelievable watching it unfold on TV. Yeah. Was there a point when you were watching it that you were thinking this might impact the start of the tour? Like, oh, did it yeah. ever, was like, that going through your mind? From the moment, away? from yeah. the moment that I saw breaking news, shooting, blah blah blah, looked out the window, saw the helicopter, saw the police cars, flashing lights, and the fact that what the images that you saw on mm. TV in that morning report were fully armed police, like sprinting around, hurting people with their guns, and like. It was confronting. Just it was confronting. Without the without having the responsibility of running yeah. the biggest event that's ever come to yeah, our country. Like exactly. we were recording in here, we came out. Yeah. And everyone was around the TVs. It was. It was like fuck. Now this is heavy. Yeah. And then knowing in a few hours, yeah. you've got the opening game of the oh, biggest mate. tournament in the history Honestly. of New Zealand. So my first thing was like, holy shit, this is happening. This is like a serious situation. I hope that people haven't died. Is this what is this? Is this terrorism? Is this like what does this mean? And then I just went straight into crisis mode and picked up my phone and was like, okay, what do we need to do here? And yeah, FIFA being FIFA has this full on like emergency structure. We have this thing called the C4 structure where like things get elevated and escalated amongst different levels. So like the lowest level is like the balls weren't delivered to the team on time inside the stadium or whatever up to, yeah shooting match day one international incident (laughs) international incident yeah so we went into full crisis mode yeah so this was the highest level yeah this was the highest level yeah we went um like uh, everyone is based in the in the park hyatt in the fifa hotel 
Uh, I rang up my boss. Um, she's not a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> But she, I think she obviously knew if I was calling her that early in the morning that there was something serious going on. And I said, boss, we need to stand up our crisis management group. Uh, there's a shooting incident uh, downtown one block from here. I'll be in your room in two minutes. Um, and we'll, yeah, set up the meeting. Wow. So it was, yeah, it was nuts. I just got dressed, basically <laughs> sprinted down to her room <laughs> on another level. And then, yeah, we were, we were... Yeah, from that moment on, in full crisis management mode. And it, and the moment that it hit me, like how serious the situation was, was when we were on a, a group call, speakerphone call, with Grant Robinson, the Minister for Sport, the Prime Minister, the President of FIFA, Gianni, Fatma and myself, yeah, Hannah Wood was there too, the New Zealand football president. And they gave us information because we had the TV on and everyone was still wondering what the hell was going on. Like, what is this? And in that call, they gave us confidential information about what was unfolding and what was going on. So we were privy to this information, which explained the situation and also by the way, gave us an immediate sense of relief that this wasn't related to the tournament. Mm. But that's when it hit me like, fuck, this is the big time. Like, this is a serious moment. We're talking to the head of the country here. He's giving us confidential information about the situation, putting us at ease as a big tournament organiser. And we've got this whole, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was surreal. It was totally surreal. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, that day was an absolute blur. Yeah, because then fast forward a few hours, Yeah, the unthinkable happens on the football field oh. and New Zealand wins their first ever match at a World Cup. I couldn't mm. believe it. What a day of emotions. It was a complete day of A to Z of the emotional scale, like fear, anticipation, nerves, joy, just pure, like raw, like ugly crying at the stadium in front of a lot of people. <laughs> uh, I was really, uh, me and Che were both at the game, I was really emotional too. And Good. I was sort of reflecting back on it. Um, I was having a pint at a bar in Kingsland. Yeah. A friend was in a bar in Sandringham. Packed, packed with people, yeah. all wearing football shirts, yeah. all going to a women's football game. Packed at Eden Park, opening yeah. ceremony, amazing. Like the way New Zealand played, the winning goal. Yeah. And we've got one of our best mates as assistant coach of the Football Ferns. Oh. So we knew the struggles of his journey yeah. across the last 12 months, how hard it's Who's been, that? the results. Michael Mayne. Ah. Oh. Yeah, so after the game, we all went down there and Rebecca Stott, who we'd had yeah. on the podcast, you know, we're, we're oh. so wrapped up in the storyline yeah. of, of these people we know so well. And yeah, it sort of all came pouring out of me at, at the end there. It was, it was such a special That's moment. That's so cool. Mm. Yeah, and so many people have said that. Like the number of people that I've spoken to that were in the stadium, uh, the opening ceremony, like the representation of Māori culture was for a lot of people like a really proud emotional moment to see the two cultures coming together. The, the football, obviously the win, but even people watching at home. Like I love hearing people's stories about what that day, what that match meant to them and how it basically sparked a revolution for women's football. And what a dream start for us. Like, you couldn't ask. Yeah, you couldn't have scripted it any yeah. better, eh? It was incredible. When you work as a journo at a game, you're meant to remain neutral. Like, yeah. even if it's your <laughs> team, you're meant to not sort of show emotion. Is it the same in FIFA? Like, are you in the VIP box and you're meant to be keeping a cool head? <laughs> oh, mate. I had, to, I had to physically get up and move out of, we have what we call, like, the protocol heart. It's like competition speak for like the real serious VIP area. It's those people that were on the call earlier in the morning, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, those people. So we it's like the seats that have like cushions <laughs> 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 yeah. and a little table next to it and you can put your drink and whatever. So that that's where I normally sit. And in that game I had to get up and move because that area is like very somber and serious and like, you know, 
and I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So I looked over and I saw um, Sarah Gregorius and Maya Jackman was sitting like a couple of bays over, obviously going nuts. Uh, so I went over and joined them and I watched the rest of the match with them like screaming my head off, crying, emotion, like being totally un-FIFA and un-neutral. But it was just, it was impossible. Like it was trying to retain a freaking beast that was inside me. There was no way I could do it. It yeah. was real, there was real, I wouldn't say fear is the right word, but there was concern that that New Zealand team yeah. were there sort of for the beating and that yeah. it, it could get ugly in that first game yeah. and the public might fall away. For them to perform the way they did, oh, the mate. best game yeah. on the biggest stage and to totally deserve that win. Yeah. Are you are you in like Gianni and I don't know, Ian Rice and a few VIP? Are you in a group chat? Are you like, oh, we are here. This is so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be so good for the tournament, right? We've got a few WhatsApp chats going on. We definitely do. Um, but just exactly what you said, the fact that people were, like, discounting them and that they did it so well was also, like, a kind of, like, a, yeah, like, vindication. I can just imagine, like, Wilkinson scores and then it's Sarai's, like, side-eye emoji. To <laughs> <laughs> we're going to fucking do it. <laughs> So good. <laughs> so good. But after that game, I had this moment with Ian Wright in the in the stands because he's here. He's like doing this really awesome content thing called um, Wrighty's Diary, and he's been going around New Zealand and Australia, like into the real kind of untouched places on the side of the World Cup, doing stuff. And so we've been in touch, and he's like the most epic, epic women's football supporter, like just through and through believes in it so much he's like mates with all the players in England he's like just a real diehard women's football supporter and after we won obviously everyone was totally you know elated and emotional and taking pictures and it was massive and then I we spotted each other like through the tribune and I was like Ian he's like Sarai and we had this like movie moment where we just ran up to each other and just had this massive hug and I think it was just so joyful, like just for New Zealand, for the start of the tournament, just for the sheer relief of the stress of the morning and the shooting and everything. It was like such a cool moment. And then that was another pinch myself moment where I was like, oh my fucking God, I'm like hugging Ian Wright in the freaking Eden Park Stadium. like As the boss of yes. the biggest <laughs> sport in the world. That was like another little like moment to remember and store away for the kids later. <laughs> that is so cool. And, and then, so after the game, you're on the, uh, and then Australia win their game, and, yeah. then, and then we're into it. And then we're into the World Cup, yeah. and you're away. Has, has each day just brought like a new adventure? Has it all just flowed effortlessly, or has it been stressful throughout the rest of the tournament? No, it gets, there's, it gets a rhythm. Yeah, like every venue gets into a rhythm. Like there's a match day rhythm that everyone kind of picks up. So, I think the first game in every stadium is a bit nervy because that's where all the teething problems come out. So I made sure that I got to as many of the stadiums as I could for their first match. Not that I could do a lot. <laughs> Something yeah. went wrong. It was like, I don't know, but I guess just being there somehow made me feel like, you know, karma. Yeah. Um, but once that first game was out of the way, like everyone just gets into a rhythm. Like there's a match day rhythm, there's a match day minus one rhythm, there's a yeah post match day rhythm, and it just starts moving like a like a machine. And yeah, once that flow is on, then it just becomes like a beautiful freaking festival of football to enjoy. Well, that flow is definitely on across the ditch. Yeah. Were you in stadium for the Aussie France oh. longest penalty shootout yeah. in World <laughs> Cup history? <laughs> That is my match of the tournament so far. Oh, yes. Yeah, that is my match of the tournament. I was in the Tribune watching that, and it was it, all the emotion, everything that you want from a football match. The crowd, the atmosphere, the back, the forth. It was so freaking even, even the stats. I, I got up and watched it the next morning straight away because I was still like, it was just such an incredible game. And the tension. <sighs> In the VIP area, I mean the whole stadium, but we had Albanese, Albo. They call him Albo. Albo. Do you, when you're at your level, are you able to nickname world leaders? 
like, you know, like in conversation go how about this game elbow <laughs> like is that is, is it real like that or is it you still have to retain some form no, of protocol no, no, i'm all about the protocol yeah i still do the protocol i mean there's a yeah how about I'm this game like, prime minister yeah <laughs> prime minister very good to see you how's it going oh prime minister did you see that goal wasn't that fantastic That's, yeah it'd be nice to just drop that <laughs> like an oh, I'm yeah. gonna say no this. i have to say though when there's big moments in games everyone loses all their decorum like well, they're all yeah. human. It's everyone is human, yeah, and they they are human as anything. The Aussies, like you know how I said that protocol heart area is like somber and serious, and you don't often hear much. In Aussie, that is not the case yeah, right. at all. Like from the top to the bottom, they are freaking screaming. Are they joining in the old oi, oi, oi? Yeah. Are they? Really? Yeah, oh, they, they even get into the wave. Really? Because you know, I, the waves have been going off in every match. Oh, yeah, I'm. Um, I'm really anti-wave, so I'm gonna. Are you? Yeah, I'm gonna sit oh, on the sidelines. Nah, no, 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 no. Let me change your. Let me change your mind it's on that. Be, it's gonna be you, hard. You got to think about the demographic that are at the. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I, I mean, I we're it. talking about kids, families. Yeah. Like. It's not all about you, man. <laughs> yeah, sure, man. Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> you, yeah, you, sure, you, you, have, you guys can all have your wave. It's fine. <laughs> It's the other one I get, like, again, no, I just thought like about myself. No, but that's a big moment yes. for a kid in yeah, a stadium, is. like a packed stadium to like witness kids a wave. love the wave. It's yeah. freaking yeah. amazing. That's All a right. memory. That's creating memories. Yeah. All right. Maybe I'll get on that wagon sometime in the future. Who knows? <laughs> um, just, just on Jen that, loves the waves. Jen would Jen love a wave. She would love She loves the waves. I bet if she's in stadia, she would be the one kicking it's off the cold, wave. too cold, sorry. You put the kickoffs too late for Jen. Ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jen. <laughs> um, just staying on that shootout, I don't remember a game that I've been that captivated with where I didn't have an allegiance to a team. Oh. I was I was watching I was watching it by myself. It was like ten o'clock at yeah. night. Everyone had gone to bed. Yeah. And I was kinda I couldn't even look. Like yeah. the tension and the nerves yeah. and the anxiety yeah. on these players' faces. I know. Yeah. And the Aussie goalkeeper, was it Mackenzie oh, Arnold? Oh, yeah. She made that amazing save yeah. and then she stepped up to be the hero. She yeah. could win it for her country. She misses. And then, and then it looked like her head's gone and she's kinda like she comes off her line for one, you're like, I'll oh, get her out of there. Her head's gone. And then she comes back and makes a sa- amazing save. Yeah. And then they have to retake it and she makes a save again yeah. and they miss the chat like oh, the drama the, drama the roller of it. coaster you of it you couldn't have planned it honestly you couldn't have planned it and every time i can't even remember who i was sitting next to who was i sitting next to oh that's right i had the french dignitaries next to me <laughs> to my left were the french um like the high commissioner of france to australia and the wife of the football federation president and to my right were some former Matildas that were there as guests. They were fucking going full out, crazy, screaming, yelling, jumping up and down, like living it as if they were in the match. And then the French were muted, serious, whatever. And I couldn't, it was so hard not to cheer for the Matildas in that moment, sitting next mm. to those French dignitaries because it was the home country, the whole stadium was yellow. And every time that, once it got to that point where we knew that the next goal was going to win and the one would just have to score, that was when, for me, it went to the next level of tense because every time a player stepped up, it was like, oh, my God, this is it. She can make or break it. Oh, my God, the entire weight of this country is on her shoulders right now. If she misses this, it's, you know, and I just, it was just being with the player in that moment and thinking, fuck, this is the make or break moment of this entire country in this tournament on the shoulders of these young women. Mm, yeah. Oh, fuck. And didn't they bloody deliver? Well, because... Oh, are you going to go? Yeah. No, totally. I'm, I'm with you on every word. Um, I think you said back in 2021 that 2023 will be the year that women's football truly goes global. Yeah. And when I was watching it, it wasn't just the penalty shootout. It was the quality yeah. of the football and... Everyone I knew was watching the game yeah. in New Zealand and around. Everyone was yeah. talking about it. Yeah. Ha- has has it gone global? Like hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Has it gone better than you could have imagined? It's gone better than I could imagine. Like I knew it was going to be good. Okay. Like I'm going to be real open here. I knew it was going to be good. We see it building up to a tournament that it's going to be good because we saw the Euros, sell out crowd for the final. We saw the domestic leagues, how many they were getting and. You see the data and the atmosphere kind of stacking up, so you know it's going to be special. So I knew it, but honestly, it has blown my expectations out of the park, like seriously. Viewership, 
attendances, atmosphere, the football, all of it has been incredible. Um, unbelievable, yeah. It's hard to take in, actually. I've been trying to enjoy it. Like, everyone keeps telling me, oh, my God, this is amazing. Look at all the numbers and this and that and this. And I can hear the words and they're telling me, and I'm like, yes, it is, it is, and I'm reading the reports. But I, I can't sit in that yet. I think because the tournament is still going, yeah. I haven't had a chance to actually just sit in the success and enjoy it and realise what that means for our sport. And that'll come. It's probably going to come while I'm on holiday and I'll probably have some kind of big emotional breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to current day. Like we said, the, there's a semi-final tonight yeah. at Eden Park. You seem relaxed. Like, is there any of that? Is there any anxiety or stress or, uh, now, or are you just enjoying the ride? For the no, rest of man, it? it's just enjoying the ride now. Yeah, it's celebration mode. There's like little details here and there which are minor, like mostly related to tickets. My phone has just become the ticket hotline for the Women's World Cup. What <laughs> did you put the request in, Shay? Have we got? Yeah. <laughs> Scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, what better way than to block out two hours of yeah. the afternoon of the game here when yeah. no one can get you? I know. This is cool. This is cool. This is super cool. But, yeah, it's now it's just celebration moments, yeah, and just getting into it and actually watching the football because there's a lot of matches early on in the tournament where you're there, you're in the stadium, you're in front of the football, but I couldn't recall too much details about the match because you're so tied up in – shit that's going on your phone people are messaging you like there's all types of like little fires to be put out people are pestering you about coming on a podcast while you're, <laughs> <laughs> while you're, back, while you're back in the country <laughs> so yeah so uh, well, that's what i've loved about the last few matches like quarterfinals tonight this is, this is such a happy time home yeah. straight it's such a successful tournament yeah. nothing to worry about you're just there to celebrate it it's so cool exactly yeah, yeah. Um, we've seen some some pics and some vids of you and Eugene and uh, Israel and Ale yeah. Alex Orkanovsky yeah. as well. They've been regular attendees at matches. How cool has that been to share that that journey with them? Yeah, it's been awesome. Yeah, it's been really good to see them. I think I think just having their support means a lot. Like m more so, my brother. I think like. Obviously, he, he knows what I do now and, you know, we're both, like, very, well, I, certainly from my side, very proud um, of, of what he's achieved. But for him to see it, like, unfold in a World Cup, in a packed-out Eden Park with sold-out crowd, in the full atmosphere, everything, like, that's, for me, quite special you know because he's my big brother we didn't always get along you know I spent a large part of my life trying to prove myself to him and get his approval you know so it was really special to have him at the opening match and some of the other matches as well for all the fighters to come for them to be in and amongst it and enjoying it like cheering on the team like every other fan like that that was a super proud moment for me yeah trying to remain humble but still be like yeah bro <laughs> check this out but <laughs> yeah. though I'm, I'm not sure i framed that well for those listening who don't know sarai's brother is eugene berryman the best mma fighter in the world israel adesanya's coach does it work the other way like have you has he expressed those same sentiments when you've been at a big event of his you know what september 10th sydney after the final of the Women's World Cup, will be my first in-person UFC oh, wow. event. Really? I can't freaking wait. And they've got six fighters on the card. Israel's defending his belt. Uh, and that is my first ever one that I'm going to in person. Like the stars have just aligned. It's happening at the right place at the right time. I'm on holiday so, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to go to it. I can't wait to, yeah, be in the stadium and just be screaming for those fighters and 
also not to be responsible for anything that's going on. <laughs> you know, if I see some shit going down, it's not my problem. I'm just going to enjoy this. <laughs> hey, Dana, where's my cushion, asshole? <laughs> where's my table? I know. It's hard not to be like super judgmental when you've been in the FIFA world because FIFA does the like everything is like on steroids, like just the next level of like everything that they do. And it's hard like to go to other events and not be like, FIFA would never do that and FIFA this and this and this. And sometimes I have to check myself and be like, no, no, no. (laughs) This is the real world. Like (laughs) this is the real world. (laughs) Not everything is FIFA. Not everything has FIFA budget. But yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, that'll be awesome. And he's, yeah, he's amazing. He's done some cool stuff. Yeah, Yeah. we're we're keen to dig around in that family background area. Um, I love when we get super successful siblings on because I'm just so interested (laughs) in unpacking like what the magic was of the family foundation. And we were lucky. We had Eugene on the podcast Mm. a couple of years ago now. And just early days, eh? Yeah. Yeah. He was one of your first, yeah. Lockdown guests. Yeah. So many good nuggets of wisdom. And, but there's one thing I want to read out that he said, uh, and I want to see if if you um, had anything similar. He said, I had a really good system where I'd put a stopwatch on and I'd set it for three hours and regardless of if I got my study done in an hour, I would work the three hours. I would stop the stopwatch if I got something to eat and restart it when I studied. I did that almost the entire year and then I got an A bursary and I went to law school. Do you remember him doing that or did yeah. you have anything similar? Something I admire about Eugene, which I'm like the complete and total polar opposite, is his discipline and his ability to stick to a regime. And it's always been that way. He's always been so organized. Like even his bedroom when we were young, you know, like you would get the full wrath of him if you went in and moved one of his fucking Tente. Do you remember those Tente ships, Tente? They're like the flash version of Lego from back in the day and they had like the ships, like full battleships, warships, um, launches, and he had like the full collection and he would spend hours like building them and they would all be lined up along the, along the dresser. And of course us other kids who were younger and not part of the special world obviously wanted to get in there and like freaking touch everything. <laughs> and he used to absolutely lose his shit <laughs> if you touched any of his like sh- battleships or tente toys or anything like that so he's always been like super regimented um and i quite admire that about him like he was like that in rugby he's like that when he was a fighter himself just the way that he trained and committed himself to it he's like that now as a coach i think he feels it more than anyone the results of the fights that his his fighters have. Um, Even from a freaking dieting, eating perspective, like he'll jump on to like a, I don't know, keto or something like that. And he'll do it from day dot, from the moment he says I'm going to do it, and he'll freaking do it like 150% cleanly to the T with no like deviations or cheat days or anything. Like he's so, yeah, he's got... Iron will. I'm like the freaking opposite. Like I'll announce, okay, I'm doing keto today. <laughs> By 3 p.m., I'm like burgers, fries, <laughs> fucking munching out. Being, like, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll start it tomorrow. Or I'm like, okay, I've got this project. I need to do it. It's due in two weeks' time or whatever. Put it off, put it off, put it off, put it off. The night before, I'll crack into it and do it. We're so opposite in that respect. Yeah. Did you did you open the, f- the, city, the first city kickboxing bank account yeah (laughs) is that true it's true I was um my first job out of school like my first like serious job was bank teller they call customer service officers these days but essentially like doing withdrawals and yeah deposits counting counting cash yeah and um in those early days when he first set up the gym you know was all new, he was getting started. And yeah, I, I took him and Doug Viney, his business partner, yeah, brought them into the bank and helped them fill out their forms and set up their account for them, got it all going. Yeah, that was, that was I remember actually, back in those days, thinking to myself, fuck, this is a big step. 
Like yeah. my brother yeah. is setting up his own business. Like this is a massive step. And I think what I love the most about seeing his success now is the journey that he's been on and how deserving he is of that success. Because a lot of people, they didn't see the struggle. And it was a fucking struggle. Like I'm telling you, there were moments where they weren't making enough in memberships to be able to cover the lease for the building. There were many times where the gym almost closed down because they couldn't stay afloat. You know, they were topping it up with their own funds. Um, the amount of time that he spent away from his children and his family, like to dedicate to that business and to the fighters. And yeah, it, it was hard, man. It was freaking hard. And there were moments where, yeah, I, I, I know they were like close to losing it all. So to see it now and know the journey he's been on, I think that's what makes me the most proud, you know, that he persevered, he went through everything, he fucking gave everything, and he deserves the success more than anyone. This this might be the coolest story in New Zealand sport. I'm just thinking as you're telling it, you were a bank teller <laughs> who opened a bank for Eugene to start his business, both yeah. with nothing right at the bottom of the totem pole, Yeah, and now you run world women's football and he is the best MMA coach in the world like it's insane yeah what what, what are the family foundations to support yeah. that success because it's not just you two I think your two other brothers are very successful yeah. in their own yeah, right as well absolutely so what was that household what were the, the the pillars of that household that allowed you guys as a family to all succeed I'm gonna say sport played a massive part in it like from a very, very young age, we were all really involved in sports. We did athletics at the athletics club, you know, every week, all of us from age five all the way through to, you know, 10, 11, 12. We all played rugby. So sport, and this is something I only recognise now as an adult in the job that I'm doing, the values that sport instills in you as a kid like how to lose graciously, how to celebrate wins together, how to be a team player, um, the fact that other people are counting on you to show up, you're accountable to others. I think having such a presence in sport was massive, but also just our upbringing. Like I think we, we had such a solid family upbringing. Like my dad has got this incredible work ethic that he instilled in us from super young um he's dutch so he also taught us a lot about you know looking after money <laughs> not fucking going nuts with everything you know and that was something really like yeah the practicalities of life and like just rolling your sleeves up and getting on with it and having a strong work ethic was like something he taught us from super young and then my mum is, yeah, she's very uh, religious. So she instilled in us, you know, those values that come with being, you know, strong Christian. Um, and I think it was just the combination of those. And just, yeah, I mean, we were all equal, all of us, you know. There was nothing, no one that was above anyone else. And it's still the same today. I mean, now when we're all in the country every Sunday, it's family dinner at mum's. You show up or you're in trouble. You ask permission to leave the table. Yeah, really? Yeah, everyone has to bring a plate. Everyone has to contribute. Everyone has to have their turn at washing the dishes after. If you don't, you get a whole bunch of shit. Like, it, it, the moment that you walk in that door, it doesn't matter if you're the best MMA coach in the world or in charge of the Women's World Cup. You're not anyone when you walk across that mantle at mum's. You're the same as everyone, you know. And I think that's also something that has kept us very grounded, yeah. What's the knowledge share like with you and Eugene? Like, do you guys <laughs> talk about your high level jobs and do you share stuff that's going on? Yeah, yeah we do. There's a few times I've had to like go to him for advice and just, yeah, it's just, it's just I don't know, it's, it's kind of weird because I guess, yeah, in those conversations we are talking about quite massive stuff but it kind of feels like just like a normal like convo. Yeah. yeah. Like 
one of the things we talked about in the build up to this World Cup was dealing with um, New Zealand rugby and the All Blacks. Because I know that during COVID, like, huge was in some battles around, like, what do you call that? Um, MIQ. MIQ, that kind of stuff, and the disparity between what the All Blacks were getting and some of the fighters and this and that. And there, there were some issues there as well with branding or something. I can't remember what it was. And then in the build up to this Women's World Cup, we had to negotiate also with the New Zealand Rugby Union and the All Blacks around the matches that they have planned in the build up to their World Cup and ensuring that they didn't overshadow what we were doing with the Women's World Cup. And FIFA being FIFA, you know, we've got all these like really stringent exclusive use periods and stuff like that. And um, the All Blacks, they rule the roost here. You know, the New Zealand Rugby Union are used to getting what they want. So I remember having a good yarn to him about that and talking about, you know, how do you deal with that, you know, when it's such an entrenched culture in this country because I know he battled that, so it was good to get his advice on that kind of stuff. But, yeah, it was, it's weird because it just feels like normal combos. But, yeah, I guess when you think about it, it is like... I love the thought of you doing that at your mum Helen's house while you're, <laughs> like, he's scrubbing the plates, <laughs> passing it over to you to, like, dry the dishes. And you're like, yeah, okay. so what you got to do in this situation? <laughs> <laughs> so what are you thinking you'll do with African Mom, football, this go? <laughs> I've got to speak a truth here. I did say it doesn't matter who you are, you still have to help with the cleaning up. Eugene has never wow. mm. once mm. ever Preach. fucking done the dishes after dinner. I never, ever have seen him ever mm. do the dishes to a, this day. And that's, a call, that's an MMA level call out. <laughs> <laughs> that's a UFC call out. That's fine. <laughs> no, but seriously, that's a freaking extreme double standard. He just doesn't. And it's at the point where my mum just doesn't even bother asking him. Like, it's just like a given now. But that's like maximum level of unfairness and it's, I'm calling bullshit. I'm glad someone finally had the balls to call him on the yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about, time. about time. Um Another curious thing, and it's not the be all and end all of your journey, but didn't university, was that ever on the cards for you? Nah. So straight from seventh form common room parties and garages and KGBs <laughs> into floor of the bank? Yeah. No, it was, you know what it was? I, it, when we left school, I feel like everyone was going off to do a BA at Auckland Uni or whatever. And I was staring down the barrel of four years at an institution and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And for me, it didn't make sense. I just thought, why am I going to commit four years of my life to studying something when I don't actually even know what it is that I want to do with my life at this point in time? So I remember talking to my parents and saying, listen, I just, I just want to take this year. I'm going to get a job. I just like, I don't know what I want to do yet. So let me just work and yeah, try and, and figure it out. And then next year I'll join uni. And at the time I was playing rugby for... Massey and there was a girl in my rugby team who was working at National Bank and we were just chatting after a game one day and I said oh I've got to find a job you know I'm not going to uni everyone else is going I've got to do something and she said oh come and apply at the bank give me your CV and I'll I was like oh yeah okay so yeah I just gave her my CV at the next training I went in for an interview and got the job and that's and that was that and then, I mean, once you start earning money, like good money, you don't want to fucking go and study. Like seriously, I tried it. Like I tried it. I'd been in banking for maybe two or three years. I was getting a good salary. And I thought, oh man, I'm missing out because all my mates were studying. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm, I'm just going to go. I'm going to have a break from work and I'll go and do it. And I went and enrolled at um, Auckland College of Education and I, I wanted to do sociology. Like I wanted to do a field that would help people six months in I was like nah <laughs> this isn't the life for me man <laughs> this, isn't the one. this, <laughs> this isn't is the one. not the one like uh, you just get too comfortable like earning and it just also dawned on me like and don't get me wrong I'm all for education everyone needs to do education but for me it just that just wasn't the path 
like learning it on the job was like a way better thing for me. So you you're in educa- uh, education. You're in finance and banking for around ten years or yeah. so. And then you find yourself in Samoa. Yeah. I'm interested. Was it like an eat, pray, love kind of a situation? Like, were you fine? Like, I don't mean, I don't, and I don't mean any disrespect, though, but were you. Sounds disrespectful. Right? Like, I, I understand, like, maybe Far Samoa wasn't a big part of your upbringing. Yeah. So, was it an opportunity for you to do some identity stuff or connect yeah, with Samoa? Yeah, big time. Yeah, big time. It's um, like, it happened. It was, I couldn't have planned it the way it happened. Honestly, I couldn't have. But basically, the yeah, we had this huge financial crisis. And at the time, I was working in property finance. So, like, our clients were, like, rich as dudes. It was all dudes who basically have built, like, everything that you see outside. Like, the waterfront development, Wynyard Quarter, all that stuff. Like, that was our client base. Like, dudes that were building those massive developments. If it wasn't those... It was massive residential developments out in Howick or wherever or whatever. So those were our clients. And those were the people that were the most heavy hit when the crisis came. Well, actually, no, I'm going to rephrase that. The most heavy hit were the mums and dads who lost their houses and everything because they'd mortgaged them to buy investments or whatever. But it was these guys that basically had so much assets and property, like beyond anything that you could even think of, like just wealth of property, but no cash. And so many of them went under. So it was like a quite a depressing like place to be working during that period of time, just to see people falling all around you and just like it was it was just not great. I was never like that passionate <laughs> about finance <laughs> as well. So it just kind of was this moment where I was actually looking for something else. Like I had updated my CV and I had started to like look in the paper and whatever and look for, for other stuff. So it was during that time and I went to Samoa for the first time because like I feel very proud of being a Samoan and it's something growing up that I – identified with a lot like I thought it was super cool to be someone I remember even at school like identifying with the cool kids at school who were someone and like it was such a, a thing for me but as I grew older I actually realized I had no idea what that actually meant um, and even though you know mum is someone we were raised as Kiwi kids like, we weren't speaking Samoan at home. The only time we were really exposed to the culture was if we went to a, a falave lave, like a funeral or a wedding or something, you know? And then we got chucked in as the half cast, like trying to do the right thing with all our Samoan cousins telling us, do this, do that. And, you know, so, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to know more. I wanted to understand it more. So I went there to meet mum's family, to just go to the country and actually see what it was like and yeah it was there that the Samoan Observer which is like the New Zealand Herald of Samoa there was a job advertised for the finance manager and I just thought yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it by then I'd been playing football okay I wanted to ask like the the romantic story in my mind was that you were a (laughs) international footballer and you were there playing but (laughs) Yeah, are those those two things disconnected? I I need to clear up this international footballer thing because it's like, what? (laughs) I hate that. Like, every time I get introduced at a conference or in an interview or something, the thing that they lead with is like national team players, Sarai Barman, Samoa, blah, blah, blah. And they make me sound like this amazing, like, (laughs) professional footballer that has now gone into administration. That is a bunch of bullshit. That is absolutely not what happened. So I, I, my first game of football was at Massey High School out in West Auckland. And then my aunt, who's a big football fan, she took me to her club, North Shore United, for my first ever game. I think I was maybe 14 or 15. And I was like the young gun, you know, they were a bunch of oldies. And I was like the young one that could sprint up and down. And I was the workhorse of that team, basically. So I started playing club football pretty young. And I went around Glenfield, North Shore, and eventually ended up at Waitak. And yeah, so I'd been playing 
by that time I come to Samoa, I think I'd been playing maybe for, I don't know, 13, 14 years by then. So I was into it. I loved it. But never to like a super high level. I think the highest I got was Northern Region, like, representative team. And in the first game, I fucking tore my ACL. <laughs> Literally in yeah. the first game. <laughs> That was my highest ever representative <laughs> honours in New Zealand. Literally went up to head the ball, came back down, tore my ACL, and it was over. So, yeah, when I moved to Samoa, and this will come later, like, yeah, I, I was like, while I was an average footballer in New Zealand, I was like, freaking amazing in Samoa. <laughs> <laughs> So you did play on that trip? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, the, okay. So, the Samoan Observer, they had this ad. I put my hat in. At the time, there was a dude. He was a Kiwi. Uh, his name is Colin Tua. He's an ex, uh, oh, he's okay. an ex uh, national team player as well. Amazing guy. Samoan heritage as well. And he was there um, leading the normalization of that federation. So, normalization is like this FIFA term which basically means that Samoa had been kicked out of FIFA because the previous dudes were, like, fully corrupt. They were spending all the FIFA money basically to, yeah, set themselves up and their families. So they'd been kicked out and they were getting n normalised. It's like going into administration as a business, right? 100%, yeah, exactly. So he was leading it and they were looking for someone to do the finance stuff, yeah. So I chucked my head in the ring. I got the job. I was really nervous at the interview. I don't think I've ever been more nervous for any interview in my life. Is that because you wanted the opportunity? Because I fucking wanted it. I wanted it. It felt like this. It felt like fate because it was like my 10-year finance background. I was in this moment in time where I was looking for something else. I wanted to get out of that. I was playing football. I loved the sport. And it kind of seemed like this fateful moment that these two parts of my life were coming together and I researched the shit out of it like I went to the Samoan library in Apia and freaking read books and did google internet searches about Samoan football and learned everything I could about it like everything like studied up like I was studying for an exam and I was so freaking nervous. I remember I wore this really bad shirt that looked good but was not the right one. And it was in Samoa, so it was like 30 degrees. It was saturated by the time I got out of the fucking interview. Like just sweating, like just full sweating through this unbreathable shirt because I was so nervous. And like rattling off all these things that I had, you know, studied. But I wanted it so bad. Like I really wanted it. Did you ever get feedback on that interview? Were they like, yeah, it was the best interview we've ever, <laughs> we've ever seen <laughs> in the history of Samoa? <laughs> no, you know what? And then they called me back for a second interview. So I went through oh. the same process. I was like, eh, okay, I'm this is it now, you know. And the, the nerves like went to the next level. So I fully prepared and I went in for the second one and I walked in and they bloody offered me the job straight away. And I was like... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> good, but good, God. but like, come on, man! <laughs> I just freaking stayed up all night preparing for this. Yeah, so I got the job, and um, I eventually became the CEO. Yeah, what was the time span on that? Like, how many years? Oh, I think I was. I think I did the finance job for maybe two and a half. Three years maximum, and started making a good impression, and then the CEO yeah. job. Well, then they, then we went out of normalisation. We became normal. <laughs> 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 and, like, F FIFA accepted us back in and, like, they voted in a new president and stuff. And, like, then um, I got appointed as the CEO under the new, like, normal <laughs> Was Did you football. have to... Or did interview for that yeah, like, was yeah. that another big stress yeah, yeah that was stressful yeah. yeah but by then the thing that had made the difference for me then was that yeah I, I knew it inside out I knew what I was talking about yeah. and although my job was finance manager like by then I had gotten fully involved I was doing coaching I was doing refereeing I was like doing mm. development stuff coaching kids every Saturday morning like I was in I was full bought into rebuilding Samoan football from the ground up. So you thought you would get that CEO job? Like, w were you voted in or was it? 
Uh, I was appointed. I had to do like a whole interview process, and the president appoints in uh, in football world. It's the president that has president. the power to appoint. So, yeah, I was a bit nervous, and other people were applying, all men. Um, but I, I had I felt like I had it. Like I knew I knew exactly what the sport needed, and I had been in it enough, and I was passionately tied to it by then. So it was a no-brainer for me. Were there a lot of female CEOs in Samoa, like in positions of real power in Samoa at the time? Like, was that a was that a thing? Mm, not at that time. There is now. Like, they've got a female prime minister now. Uh, but at that time, no. And it was quite shit at the beginning. Um, just being a woman, and I think also the the big thing was being a half caste. Or Afakasi. I say that about myself. People say I shouldn't because it's like derogatory, but that's how I saw myself. And I couldn't speak the language. I didn't know anything about the culture when I came in early. So I was treated basically like a Palangi, like an outsider. And uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty shit in the early days. Like uh, just not being respected. There were some like quite, horrible like incidents with like basically being yelled at by like club presidents and stuff about getting into the kitchen like stuff that you yeah just not nice um there was a few moments where I questioned like why the hell am I doing this seriously why um but by then it was too late like I was in love with it yeah I've heard you speak really passionately about being in Samoa and I guess the moment you realised the power that football had and yeah. I think it was around a relationship with Special Olympics yeah. in Samoa. Are yeah. you able to kind of talk in any yeah, detail yeah, yeah. Ar- around that for yourself? So we partnered with Special Olympics on this thing, the Just Play program. You know that one. It's like a social responsibility program that is basically used to expose kids to football and through football teach them life skills. And things as basic as like in Samoa, we were doing stuff like the importance of washing your hands and drinking water instead of Coke and whatever. So it was through that program we did this one with Special Olympics. Now, if you know Special Olympics, they work with athletes with intellectual disability. So like Down syndrome, different kinds of, uh, yeah, intellectual disability. So this is, yeah, I can't. It's going to be hard for me to talk about this without crying. We, with this program, we went out to Gua. We call it Gua, which is like the outback of Samoa, like the villages that are far out from the main town centres. And we had done some research, so we knew in which villages these kids or athletes were. So we went out with our football van and our big bag of balls and all our equipment and everything. And we ran this program and what shocked me, and this is me growing up in New Zealand, you know, having what I've had, where we got out to these villages and in some cases, these kids were like hidden in their houses. Like there was a stigma and a lack of knowledge and understanding about their disabilities and their family, for one reason or another, were were hiding them. They were ashamed. They weren't coming outside. They were, yeah, not, not part of society. And I remember this one boy in particular, and I just remember going into the house, sitting, because if you know a Fale Samoa, it's like a very simple, basic structure. And... We went in and we sat down, crossed our legs on the floor. You know, we had ear lava lavas on to cover mm. ourselves. And my team was speaking in Samoan to the, the, the parents. And we were trying to convince them to allow their son to come out and be part of this football activity. And eventually they, they did. And we had this game. It's like a modified game of football on a small field. And we had the kids with intellectual disabilities as well as other kids from the village, 
all mixed together. They call it unified. And they were playing. And it was incredible to see the parents of that young boy in that moment, everything that they thought about their son and his ability changed. Everything. He was playing with the other kids. The whole village was watching. Everyone was cheering him on. They saw this level of acceptance that their son, that they never even dreamed would be possible because of football. And the other kids were interacting with him and he was freaking enjoying it, like just having the best time of his life. And that's when I realized, holy shit, this is so much more than just a game. Like this is life changing, this platform, this sport, look at what it can do. And that was for me like, I already loved the game at that point, but that's when that love just turned into like a deep passion for using it as a way to impact kids like that kid and that family and that village. And yeah, it was it was so special. And even today, now today, if I'm struggling, and this is fucking hard sometimes in FIFA and women's football as well, I think about that kid and it gives me, yeah, the energy. Give me a fucking tissue, someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good man ads, good man ads. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, holy shit. Like in the telling of that story, it just became so clear to me why you're in the position. Yeah, now. 100%. Um, not, I mean, what we've covered already, but the authentic empathy and connection to the game and the power of its importance like uh, it's so special i'm gonna try i'm, I'm not meaning to no. but, I, but i want to dip into the well again because i do know yeah. this was another foundation <laughs> moment which was speaking at the pacific youth and sports yeah. conference in new caledonia yeah i don't know the timelines of those mm. the special olympics partnership and that address which mm. i understand was very powerful mm. where you spoke to the challenges of being a woman in pacific society yeah. ascending to a leadership position yeah can you take us to numia You've got the tissues now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let me have a drink. God. Okay. Sorry, Mum. I just blessed named. Okay. We'll, we'll remove that so she doesn't listen. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that was after. So this is by this time that I did that speech. It's when I understood and knew what football was, what it really meant. And... It was around that same time that I was experiencing like quite a bit of um, sexism, like just innuendos, like these kind of like gross innuendos of everything. Like I'd stand up to address a meeting and you just get gross comments and wolf whistles and just yuck. Like walking through the office, like getting groped, like just gross stuff. Um, and I was over it. I was over it. It pissed me off because I thought, fuck this. Like, why is it like this? When actually this is such an awesome sport to be working in. Why do I have to deal with this kind of bullshit when I'm trying to deliver and do something I feel so strongly about? And that was at that time that... Frank Castillo, who's now the General Secretary of Oceania, he was running this, yes, Pacific Youth and Sports. It's basically all youth from all around the Pacific, from different sporting codes. They all came together in New Caledonia for this massive, like, conference. And he had asked me to speak. And I was thinking for a long time about what I was going to speak about. And... It was actually that anger from a moment in a meeting where I literally got yelled out of the room. Um, it was the time that I got told to get to the kitchen 
and by then my Samoan was getting a little bit a little bit okay you know and um, I, I understood what they were saying because in the early days they would speak about me in Samoan like say heaps of shit about me and because I couldn't understand it like I you know but once I started to pick it up anyway so it was at that moment, it was in a particularly bad low point, and I remember walking out of this meeting and closing the door to my office, and I cried, and I remember thinking, fuck this, like, why am I doing this? I'm away from my family, I'm in this country, like, why am I even bothering? I should just pack it in. And it was around that moment that I decided that I would talk about those challenges. Yeah, and I was angry and probably a bit naive too about what it was that I was going to be saying and who I was going to be talking to. So I had this whole thing written out and, you know, I, I went into detail. Like I actually went into detail saying, you know, this moment, this happened to me. I've been groped. I've been sexual innuendos, this, that. Like I went into detail. And it was also my first time <laughs> like doing a big speech in front of like more than a thousand people. So it was like a kind of a, yeah, I was su super nervous. And yeah, I got up on the stage and uh, I got emotional during it, but I spoke my truth and I, I was, it was driven by this kind of anger. And what's actually what is a funny thing that I always remember is some of the people who had harassed me were in the room. Yeah. And that was also like important to me that they heard what I had to say without me telling it directly to them. And I even remember like thinking, yeah, I hope you fucking know that I'm talking about you. Yeah. So I said it and the crowd started to respond. Like I started to get these like whoops, like encouragement, encouraging me to go on. So, and I started to, you know, I felt I could just feel this buzz in the room that people were like into it. And then at the end, you know, I finished and everyone just roared, like totally roared. And that was cool. I was like, holy shit, okay, this was good. But it wasn't until I walked off the stage I couldn't even get past like one step away from the stairs and I was just swamped by women, other Pacific women from all those islands that were there, Cook Islands, Papua New Guinea, Tonga and Solomon Islands, Fiji, Tonga, like all these women that I'd never met and it must have been, I must have been there for like, I don't know, two hours talking to them and all they were saying was thank you for sharing because I'm going through this in my country and I have this going on with me and this person is doing this to me and they were so grateful that someone spoke openly about what is going on and I was so grateful to learn holy shit, there's a whole bunch of women out there that are also dealing with this kind of bullshit. And that is not good enough. That is rubbish. Yeah, so that was also like, it just, I don't know, that was a pivotal moment for me also as a woman in a position of leadership to understand the power that I had in that position to influence change for other women. And also to know there's nothing that I'm going through that other women are not going through as well. And that somehow gives you strength. Just being able to express to another woman, yeah, this is bullshit, this is absolute rubbish, I'm dealing with this, you're dealing with this. Just to have that connection, that's powerful, man. So that was another moment. And it was, yeah, it sounds, <laughs> I don't know how it sounds. It sounds fucking awesome yeah um what was the response like what what happened in the days and weeks after like was this a catalyst for your right like did you get on people's radar because of your yeah the way that you spoke 100 percent. that moment that speech that's when i kind of people knew about me 
And yeah, it was that led to a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, I mean, I eventually started working for Oceania in the Pacific region. But people were, people still talk to me about it. Yeah, really? People that were there still talk to me about that. They come up and go, I was there at that moment in 2013 when you did that speech. So we're going to start r- 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 charting your rise to FIFA. Like, was <laughs> this, did, you became OFC Deputy General Secretary a year afterwards, right? 2014? Yeah. Do, do you think that was directly related to that speech? Yeah, 100%. It was, uh, at that point, I felt also, you know, the time I moved to OFC was also the right time for me to move on because football in Samoa was fantastic at that point in time. We had kids programs, grassroots going every weekend. We had talent ID programs. We had the national teams playing, youth, senior. We had the national league. We had the business competition that was, everything was going and it was smooth and it was awesome. And I just, I had, I was kind of at this point where I felt like I, it was time to move on. And having that speech and that moment of recognition, but also that greater understanding of what I could do with my platform, it gave me this motivation to kind of go out and go bigger. Yeah. So, yeah, I went, I came back to Auckland. I was here for a trip um, in Auckland. And, yeah, I went into the office in Oceania and asked them for a job. I said, listen, I'm ready to come home. I'm ready to move on. I want to stay in football. It's really important to me that I stay in football. Do you have a job for me? And they did. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, (laughs) the FIFA world explodes. (laughs) And it's the worst crisis in global football history. Oh, bro. (laughs) Like, you're like listening to your story in isolation, global financial crisis. Yeah. There's a catalyst for change in your your situation. And then this FIFA crisis in 2015, and there's a change... It's like you're somehow the universe has attracted you <laughs> to chaos, but also smoothing out those yeah. waters because you were really pivotal in yeah. terms of that, that reshaping of FIFA. Yeah, big time. Yeah, it was. Um, it was so interesting because at the time I was working in Oceania, I was a deputy general secretary, and they have these massive FIFA congresses every year. So FIFA congresses, like all the two hundred eleven countries from FIFA come together in one location. They stay in these amazing hotels and have this beautiful experience and they all go in and vote on things like statutes and whatever. So it was like this huge event and I was there with all the OFC people. This is in Zurich in Switzerland in 2015. At the same time, the under 20 World Cup was happening here in New Zealand. It was. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So we were there having our usual meetings and we woke up (laughs) and I remember waking up and it was almost the same as the situation on match day one Mm. with the shooting. In the hotel room, woke up, my phone was going off. I was like, what is happening? Turn on the TV and on CNN, and that's when you know shit is real. (laughs) When it's on CNN. Um... They showed the Boralak, which is like the swankiest hotel in Zurich, which is the one where all like the main, main dudes were staying, like the president and all the executive people. They showed police cars swarming outside that fucking five-star hotel and police escorting people out in handcuffs under bed sheets into police cars. And the headlines were like FIFA officials arrested, blah, blah, blah. And I couldn't believe what was going on. I was like, what? <laughs> what is happening? It was so surreal. It was this other moment. So, yeah, we went again. It was like this kind of crisis mode. I mean, we didn't have anything to do with that, obviously. But I just remember everyone on that day were like, what is happening? What is going on? Like, this is the biggest 
global body for sport internationally. Our president, all the main like executive dudes, were basically being arrested <laughs> on TV. <laughs> on live TV. On live TV. <laughs> and I, I just remember sitting there and thinking, fuck, what does this mean? Yeah, yeah and they went, yeah, I mean, fuck, they were all corrupt. They were all corrupt. And they, yeah, I mean, they deserved it in the end. They got their just desserts. But, yeah, that was another moment. And what that meant was FIFA was, like, inches away from being declared a criminal organisation by the US Department of Justice. What that actually means is FIFA was about to be declared the same level as the mafia, like an actual criminal mafia organization. Like that's how serious it was and how deep the corruption was and how entrenched it was. And the money changing hands, the backdoor deals that were going on. I mean, it's all been documented now. You can read books about it. Fucking crazy levels of corruption. Um, and yeah, FIFA was, seen to be part of that like a, a criminals and so they decide to create a reform committee yeah and 15 people yeah you get chosen yeah <laughs> because of the work you'd done in Samoa sort of rebuilding th that situation from yeah corruption so little old Samoa tiny island in the Pacific 200,000 people went through the same thing, obviously on a way smaller scale, but essentially it was the same rebuild that was required. Normalisation of FIFA. Let's <laughs> <laughs> make FIFA normal again. There's, a, there's, an, there's an excerpt from the FIFA Reforms Committee report, which Stephen has pulled out to quote, to kind of put some context for those that aren't super into kind of football cop politics, yeah. what it meant. Yeah. I don't know if I'll read the whole thing. It, it says uh, FIFA is currently going through the worst crisis of its history. The current crisis should also be considered as a unique opportunity for FIFA to renew itself. Thus, in order to restore confidence in FIFA, significant modifications to its institutional structure and operational processes are necessary to prevent corruption, fraud, self-dealing, and to make the organisation more transparent and accountable. So they, I guess, to set up this committee, they're looking for people with integrity, right? Yeah. That is the key component and then you get selected to, yeah. to be in this select group. And then, yeah, that was another pivotal moment. Mm. <laughs> it was like little old Samoan New Zealander going on up to Zurich as part of these reforms. And that was, yeah, I was the only woman in the room and I distinctly remember the very first meeting um, feeling super nervous and walking into this boardroom to all men in suits and I remember also quite vividly I was wearing a skirt on that day skirt and heels <laughs> great pair of heels actually and uh, thinking holy shit I'm one of a kind in here yeah did you have the flower I had the flower did you have the flower I had the flower can you explain to us the significance <sighs> of the flower and why you wear yeah. it particularly again You've described it as a room full of suits. For those that aren't, FIFA then was probably a very traditional, yeah. well, it was, I was part of it. It was a very traditional organisation, always suits, very, very formal. Yeah. The sight of a woman with a flower in her hair was yeah. maybe only a handful of people around the world <laughs> did it at the time. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, it's a say. We call it a say in Samoa. And I wear it everywhere I go, actually, like everywhere. And I do that because, well, I explained to you guys the experiences I had in Samoa, like that Special Olympics program, the passion that I felt for the game, it all grew from my time in Samoa. And honestly, I think like Samoa for me has a very special place in my heart because it was a turning point for my life, my career, my journey into football. 
I met my husband there. I understood my culture, my roots. I became who I am today because of my time in Samoa. And I never want to forget that. And I never want to forget that it's what I learned there in that journey that put me on the path to where I am now. And it doesn't matter how high I get or what organisation I end up in, I never want to forget that. And that's why I always wear it. It makes me feel connected to my purpose in the sport. And sometimes it gets so intense. I mean, football is the most political sport in the world. The money, the interest, the commercialization of it, like just, it's just so intense. And sometimes it's easy to forget why we are there and who we serve. And for me, the flower is that. It always reminds me of that boy in that village whose life changed forever because of football. And sometimes you just have to be reminded of that. Yeah. So I had it. I had it on that first meeting. Yeah. And I felt it felt out of place, real out of place. <laughs> Does it feel normal now? Now it's totally normal. Yeah. If I don't wear it, people are like, where is it? Yeah. Demanding to see it. Like <laughs> That's they, what we said, eh? Hey? Yeah. Put, put it back in. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this is where it starts to get really epic. So 2015, <laughs> you're in the reform committee. 2017, FIFA appoint a chief women's football officer yeah. for the very first time. And have I got this timeline right that in that reform committee, you and Gianni, who's now FIFA president, yeah. were working really closely together and he was really impressed with the work you were doing or you, were, you guys had a really good relationship? Yeah. And then was it, was it his job to appoint you? Yeah, so he, that was the first time I met him. I, he was the... Secretary General or the big boss of UEFA at that time. Um, so he was on the committee representing Europe. I was there representing the Pacific region and Oceania. And because I was the only woman, I advocated strongly for more women to come into football, especially in leadership, and for women's football to be more resourced. And we did all these things. And was like a super serious full-on FIFA committee atmosphere so you know you had to table proposals you had to write and draft like reform regulations and he's a lawyer he has a legal background you know I'm like West Auckland Massey High School <laughs> no <laughs> university education yeah. you know street smart but maybe yeah. not you know so I needed help like I knew what I wanted I knew what we needed and why we needed it. But to articulate it and put it into legal speak and put it into actual like reforms that could be written into the constitution, that's where he came in. And he was actually in that committee. Every time I put something on the table or spoke up, he was the first guy to back me and support me in all those cases. And he helped me to draft what I needed to draft to get it approved. And now, in fact, what we drafted together is enshrined in the in the statutes of FIFA. Yeah, um, yeah so it's, it's also like a kind of a full circle moment because we was able to get those things across the line. He s somehow became the president of FIFA. Like neither of us were even dreaming of anything beyond what we were doing at that point in time in that committee but he eventually became the president I went back to my job in OFC I was super happy there like working in Auckland and I had a dream job like working across the Pacific region expanding my impact um, yeah I was so happy and then I was in the office and um, Mount Smart Stadium was where the old OFC office was and I got the Swiss number on my mobile phone. And I was like, ah. Oh. And I didn't, I actually, the first time I saw it, I was kind of a bit busy, so I didn't answer it. 
I just like blanked it and, you know, Seamus knows what's that like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was Seamus' move for about five years. No, getting blanked. I don't know what it's like to get blanked by oh, Sarah. Right. Don't worry about yeah. that. The other way when you hit a competition. Yeah, so eventually I answered it and it was, um, yeah, it was Switzerland. And that first call was actually from Matthias. I don't know if you've met Matthias. He's like the right hand man to yeah. Gianni. He's the hand of the king to use a game to use a Game of Thrones <laughs> analogy. He's he works the lobby. He's a guy that works the lobby. Oh, like it's it's incredible to see him at work. He's the dude. Yeah, yeah. he's like a savant. Like yeah. seriously, like working with him is like he just operates at this other level. He's on the matrix level. Anyway, it was him, and you know I know now I know him well. Then I didn't, but he opens up the call like, "How are you doing? How's things?" What's happening? And it's like five to ten minutes of small talk. And I'm like, what does this guy want? Like, seriously. And eventually he got to the point. Uh, he asked me, yeah, basically said that they wanted me to come. They've set up a division for women, dedicated to women, as part of the reform to drive forward everything that we had written in to those reforms. And, the, he, and they wanted me to come and lead it. And I couldn't, I actually didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. Yeah. But of course I was like blown away. And I, I think I even told him I needed to get back to him. <laughs> like as if I was going to say no. <laughs> but I did, yeah. And then I hung up that phone call and I just stood there for, I don't know, it felt like ages. And then I rang my mum straight away. And as soon as she answered, I started crying. And I said, Mum, I've just been offered this job. I don't know what to do, da, da, da. And Mum, immediate Mum response, immediate, was let's pray. And I got down on my knees in the office in OFC. And I was on the phone. And my Mum was praying. And I was crying. And we prayed together. And then, yeah, I accepted the job. Did you have moments where you were talking to someone maybe outside of the football circle and you'd be talking about your new job? They'd be like, oh, cool, what is it? Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of chief of women's football across the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry? You're not doing banking anymore, are you? <laughs> <laughs> nah, I kind of moved on from that. 211 <laughs> member association, yeah. It's kind of my, my job. That, that's yeah. an anecdote, right? First day in the office, there's a world map yeah, behind dude. you. <laughs> yeah. Because the world's a big place. It's so. a fucking big place. And when you go into FIFA and all the executive offices, they have these giant world maps like behind the desks. And I remember on my first day, like, I don't know if you've been to FIFA. Like FIFA, the building FIFA in Zurich is like a freaking bunker. It's like this massively impressive, state-of-the-art, incredible building on the hill in Zurich. And it reminds me, even now when I drive in underground into the bunker, of this program I used to watch when I was a kid called Maxwell Smart. Yeah. <laughs> get smart. Get yeah, get yeah. smart. Yeah. I can't remember the tune. And you have to, and he, in the start of that program, he goes through all these yeah. doors and all these things and these secret things and blah, blah, blah. That's what it's like when you enter into FIFA. You like enter down and the doors open and you have to use your fingerprint to get into, it's like this intense like environment. And that's what it was for me on my first day. And I actually remember video calling my mum on my first day when I was walking into the office there because I was still like in this moment of like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm working here. And holding my phone up in front of me with mum on video call as I was walking into the office and being like, yeah, look at this mum. And mum was on it at the same time, like being in this moment of like, you know, and we got to my office and my name was on the door and I remember holding up the phone and like, look at my name on the door and whatever. So it was like this really cool moment. And then I went in and I sat down and all the people that were greeting me left and I was like left in the office. And uh, there's like this massive football pitch to one side with all the 211 flags of every country. 
there, like on the side of the pitch. So you kind of see it and you're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I just remember looking and looking for the Samoan flag and spotting it and being like, okay. Then I sat in the chair and then I turned around to this giant like world map that was behind the desk. And I remember thinking, holy shit, <laughs> we are not in Samoa anymore. <laughs> like it was just this, it just dawned on me the magnitude of the job. And I freaked out. Like I just had this little moment sitting alone in this office in Zurich in the middle of winter. It was snowing. I had the wrong shoes on. It was a terrible start to the day. And yeah, just looking at the world map and thinking, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? Because it is quite daunting because it literally didn't exist before. Yeah. The job. No. Was the job description like a blank bit of paper? Yes. Like, are you just making it up as you go along <laughs> in the initial stages? Well, the job description was like basically two sentences, which essentially said in a roundabout way, you're in charge of women's football all over the world, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> hey Gianni, you know that law degree? Uh, <laughs> I want it back, mate. This job description's it's unreal. It's unreal. Yeah. So it was. Yeah. I re- I just remember that first day, like just thinking, oh man. Are you, have you heard of imposter syndrome? I've written imposter syndrome on my notes. Yes. Like right there. Mm. <laughs> That's I was like, exactly did, what it was. Did you have that? Hundred percent. For how long? <sighs> I think it was the first, I don't know, probably the first like couple of weeks because it wasn't just starting a new job and a new company. It was moving to Europe in the middle of winter it, with freaking minus 10 degrees and snow fall outside. Coming from West Auckland, living in Samoa, you know, I'd never seen any of that. Which, okay. was, which was harder for you, the transition from New Zealand to Samoa or the transition from New Zealand to Switzerland? New Zealand to Switzerland. Yeah, 100%, hands down. It was, it was a culture shock. Like, people talk about culture shock. That's the first time I actually understood what it meant. Like, I, I think New Zealanders have a certain way about them. In fact, I know now New Zealanders have a way about them because I've seen enough countries now and met enough people to understand how... New Zealanders are unique and I carried that with me to a country that didn't accept that. How how, how do you mean New Zealanders are unique? What do you mean specifically? I've learned now with this Women's World Cup, they call it manaakitanga and it's something that we live in the way that we interact. It's Lining up at Pack and Save in the checkout counter to get your groceries and having a full, deep and meaningful conversation to the person behind you that you've never met before in your life. And you walk out of there knowing how what the names of their kids and whatever and blah, blah, blah. It's that. It's that. I don't know how to articulate it apart from explaining it like that. That doesn't exist everywhere and it certainly doesn't exist in Zurich in Switzerland. Like... If you go up to someone with that same kind of um, feeling of knowing, they look at you in disgust. Like they feel offended. And I only know now it's a cultural thing. In the beginning, I just thought everyone was assholes. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> but now I know it's like a cultural thing. Like the Germans and that part of Switzerland, they just culturally they're very closed off they have very very tight-knit groups that they grow up with like their friends from young and their family and that's their group and that's that and you I mean to try and penetrate those friendship groups and try and it's it's just impossible so the way that we are like just yarning to anyone and having a good chat and a laugh and whatever over there they get pissed at you if you try and do that if you're too familiar with them and you don't know them, they get really offended. And that was a shock for me in the beginning because I just went in there super naive. I didn't think there was any kind of cultural lessons I needed to learn. It was Europe. I was like, okay, this is going to be fine. 
But yeah, I learned really quickly and it was lonely in the beginning because I moved alone. Um, by that, I mean, my husband was working, he's a quantity surveyor, Mark, and he had a good job, he was in a good company, he had just started like in a new role. He was doing awesome. And I was like, wow, like just let's not uproot everything. I'll go, let me like go up there and just like see what it's like. Let's see if this thing is legit. <laughs> <laughs> let me just boss women's football in the world for a little bit and just see if it's, if it's all it's cracked up to No, me. but it was, it was like this big unknown. And I was really like, okay, let's not uproot our entire life and like turn everything around. Like I need to go see if it's real. So the first year I went alone, just me. And combined with that culture shock, the distance, the time difference, and just getting into a new company, like the first month was lonely. It was freaking lonely and it was hard. And it had me in that same position questioning again. And then you combine it with this new world, the world map, the 211 countries. Women's football was also relatively new to me. I mean, I've worked in football for a long time by then, but I hadn't been specialised in women's football. So I was also having to learn a whole bunch of stuff about the women's game as well. And I felt like an imposter, like really. I really did. Um, was there a moment when that subsided? Or was there a key part or a trip or anything that you can think, like you have pinpointed in your Samoan mm, journey, mm. where the penny dropped? Yeah, yeah. I would say it's a collection of moments, but the thing that gave me confidence which I realised really quickly is that I had a leg up on everyone there because I had been in a federation, I had rebuilt the sport of football from scratch in a country, I had been exposed to football in a developing setting with challenges in front of it and the people I were working with, awesome people, but many of them had never even been into one of our member countries and visited them. And I realised when we were having these conversations, we were going into meetings, I was trying to get my head around it and develop a strategy quite quickly that actually little old Samoa and what I learnt then and there and the lessons that I still carry with me now gave me a massive leg up on all of those people. Um, and I was able to contribute to the conversations and build, in fact, <laughs> the entire global strategy to grow women's football off the back of those experiences in the Pacific. Amazing. Which, as a sentence, is nuts. But in practicality, <laughs> 211 countries, like <laughs> South Sudan and USA, yeah. like... You couldn't get more polar opposite in terms of women's football experiences, I imagine. First, yeah. like the newest country in the world yeah. and the powerhouse of women's football. Yeah. And you've got to bridge the gap between yeah. those two. Yeah, yeah, that's a daunting task. Yeah. But it was, I remember the first session because well, the first thing we had to do, which we were tasked with doing, which is also like a nuts moment, was like, okay, we're here now. We've got this new division. We've reformed the organisation. We have all this constitutional change we need to come up with a global strategy for women's football. <laughs> I was like, okay, here's your I first task. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Fuck, man. I was like, what? Okay. And we, in the bunker, like, the thing about FIFA, the, this office in Zurich is like, there's all these, like, Swiss restrictions around the building. So there's, like, it's six levels, right? There are two levels that are above the ground and there are four levels below the ground. So we're in, I call it minus three, uh, where they have all these meeting rooms there. And what well, I went down there with my team and we spent a full day just like <laughs> with, uh, what do you call those? Sticky notes, post-it notes, post-it notes, just writing like all the challenges, the reality, what it means. And I remember like we must have been down there for, I don't know, like eight hours. We had lunch delivered and everything. And the whole entire wall of this entire fucking thing was just covered in multicolored post-it notes. 
and this was another moment and the team were exhausted and whatever and I was like that's fine you know we'll set it up for tomorrow and whatever and so they all left and I remember sitting down and looking at all the post-it notes and being like holy shit (laughs) 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 this is crazy (laughs) what is this um but that was literally the start of it and we were able to, you know, and eventually that room full of post-it notes with the, you know, obviously the experience of the room combined with visits to many different countries, conversations, meetings and everything, we were able to develop this, this strategy and that's carried me through to today, yeah. How did your nerves compare um, match day minus one this World Cup versus <laughs> match day minus one 2019 World Cup because that was your first major yeah, event, yeah, right? Yeah, it was. It was different because in this World Cup, I've been involved from the get go, like the bidding, the selection of the host countries, like the first initial meetings, like everything from A to Z. I've been in it. Whereas in 2019, there was the structure was slightly different. We had like a whole events delivery kind of arm that were in charge of delivering the event so I was in charge of what we call the product the strategy like setting the um, setting the tone the brand the the overall kind of product but the delivery I just washed my hands of it handed it over and it was like a whole nother area that was in charge of it whereas this one I'm it from A to Z, the product, the strategy, the brand, all of it, the whole building of it, the expansion to 32 teams, everything, uh, as well as physically delivering it, meetings, the logistics, the operations of it. So yeah, this one was way more intense. And just the fact that it's here, it's home. Like I I feel a lot of pressure. And the fact you've smashed it. (laughs) Yeah, that's amazing. (laughs) This is just like the best episode ever. Um, Perks of the job. Meeting, oh. Ma- meeting Maradona? Yeah. You met Maradona? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met Maradona several times. I actually played football with him. No. I swear to God. We have this um, Congress football tournament where the delegates from the 211 countries, they get to play like small-sided games with some FIFA legends against each other. So it's like Oceania versus Africa versus Europe and the FIFA team and blah, blah, blah. And Maradona was one of the legends who was involved in that tournament. He wasn't on my team. I played against him. But I, that was a moment where I just remember going out onto the field, seven aside, and Maradona, I mean, he was old by then. He, his knee was heavily strapped and whatever, but, man, he still had the magic. He still had the magic. And I just remember thinking, who the fuck can say that they have played a game of football with Maradona. <laughs> Who can say a lot of the things you've said? <laughs> Who can <laughs> say that? Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible body of work, really, when you put it down. And also, the like, it's really, again, putting the pieces of the puzzle together, it's really easy to see how, why you are successful because you've seen it from ground zero right the way yeah. through. I imagine, though, as well, it's not without its challenges because we talk about women's rights, we talk about women's football, we talk about discrimination, we talk about racism. Your job will take you to places where access and those things still don't exist and are still challenging and are still, I guess, open secrets. Yeah. Um, Are there challenging moments in the role as well where you feel like as much as you're trying to break the door down, the door's staying locked? Yeah, yeah, big time, yeah. But I feel like I've learned enough to know how far to push it. And that's a fine art and a skill, actually, to know the environment enough to understand that this is the limit. Don't push past here because that's not going to benefit anyone. But, yeah, there's, there's hard moments as well. I mean, even in the build-up to this Women's World Cup, you know, there are some... I wouldn't call them scandals, but a few moments that were tough to deal with. Uh, there was some stuff about uh, Saudi, visit Saudi, mm. who is a FIFA sponsor. They sponsored the World Cup in Qatar. Uh, they're a sponsor for the Club World Cup as well. 
there were some talks about them coming on board for women's football as well. And here in New Zealand and Australia, people were absolutely up in arms about that, you know, just because of, I guess, the human rights stuff that's happening in Saudi. That was tough because I've seen a part of Saudi through football, which is totally different. Like we've been working with women in Saudi Arabia for like three years now, and they've stood up the first ever women's league there. They had their first ever national team game. So I have this different lens on it because of the work that we've been doing through football. And it was quite hard for me to deal with some of the rhetoric around, you know, how could FIFA do this? How could you be talking to a partner like this? Um, I got a lot of DMs, like real negative ones, some of them quite abusive as well, which you get used to as a public kind of person. But yeah, there, there are definitely challenging moments. And we got through that, and it's fine. But um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's never easy, let's say. <laughs> Where do you go from boss of women's football across the world like what is the next i mean there, there will be a time when you move on but like <laughs> is is the jump president oh dude <laughs> <laughs> i didn't mean to ask that question but uh, like i honestly i i don't know like i can't th what has worked for me until today is not planning anything like I just everything that has happened on this path because I get this question all the time how did you get here how did you get to this position better cross that one off before we ask <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we've done two hours on that. <laughs> no but you see it's like there's no like one answer to that it's yeah, like actually yeah. like you know it just happened that the girl in my rugby team was working at the bank and I got a job there it just happened that I was in Samoa when that job was advertised you know, it just happened that I was in the role in Oceania when the FIFA corruption happened. It just happened I was the only woman in that reform committee. You know, it wasn't, I couldn't have planned it the way that it happened. So I often get this question, like, what is next after this? And I think, I don't know. I think there's a path for me, you know, I've, I'm a Christian. The influence of my mum is really strong on me. She reminds me every time I see her that I need to pray. And I believe that my path is already laid out. So I don't think about what's next. I never have. Um, and whatever has planned, you know, I know that God has already set it up. Yeah. You talk about your mum. Through your journey, you also became a mum to Matisse. <laughs> How did that impact your work-life balance? Because I imagine the demands on you yeah. in a professional capacity are yeah. huge. And then you bring a life into the world oh, and you've got competing agendas. Yeah. And maybe as a, as a follow-on to that, the role of Mark, I guess, in kind of terms of balancing yeah. all of that out. Yeah. I had a quite a, um, let's say, a, a stressful pregnancy. <laughs> like thinking about that, just thinking about what it, would mean for me in my position heading into a World Cup uh, on the other side of the planet um, and how I was going to manage being a mum within that. And I'm really, honestly, blessed. And it sounds like hashtag blessed, like, you know, but really, uh, Mark has just played a role in my journey that without it I wouldn't be where I am today not just with the baby and what he's doing now but the way he has supported me in my career coming to Switzerland with me you know giving up his own career moving he spent 12 months learning German to get a job and integrate into Swiss life you know and he while I was pregnant just came up to me one day totally 
out of the blue and said, I want to resign. I'm going to look after the baby full time. And I, <laughs> I kind of couldn't believe it when he was telling me that, but obviously I was so grateful. So from the moment that Matisse was born, uh, yeah, they've, I've, they've been with me. I took my maternity leave. That was our special time together as a family. It was amazing. Uh, Mum flew over from New Zealand. She was there when the baby was born. He was born during COVID. Oh, God. Mark got COVID in the week of my due date. Oh. Yeah. You couldn't have... Oh, honestly. It was... Yeah. So it, that was tough. Basically, Mark wasn't allowed to come in because he had COVID mm. and I had to, yeah. So he eventually, we managed to negotiate that he was there in the operating theater when I gave birth um, and he was in full like PPE, head to toe, mask, everything. Um, but he wasn't allowed to stay with me. He wasn't allowed to yeah, come into the hospital room and visit me. It was like a, it was a scary, but special. Because it meant that it, those first six days of Matisse's life it was just us. And man, that was, I would say, the most special and important moment of my life. Like spending that time with my newborn son and just understanding what it means to be a mum. And it eclipses every fucking thing that I've talked about. Everything I've done in my career, everything that I've achieved is totally eclipsed by having a son. Like, it's just unbelievable. Indescribable. I don't know. Does FIFA have a crash? Nah, I'm advocating. <laughs> I'm advocating. You know what? It's... Uh, it is actually like that. Like, I'm in the management board of FIFA. Okay, so I have this kind of privileged position. In FIFA, the management board, we all have our own offices. Like, we can close the door, we have our own office with a desk and meeting table and blah, 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 and whatever. Everyone else in the organization has to share an office. It's like three or four or six to an office or whatever. When I returned from maternity leave, I had to pump to pump milk every day while I was away from the baby to you know keep the supply going and to, to be able to feed him the next day so I would lock the doors in my office I'd had a little sign which I put up to say pumping mm. it's kind of a joke yeah mm. 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 <laughs> exactly it's like being milked like a cow I swear to god anyway the places where I have been sitting pumping milk Oh my God, I can't even tell you. Airports, airplanes, um, prayer rooms and stadiums in Qatar at the World Cup. I've been pumping milk in the weirdest locations in the first like six months of honestly. But anyway, the point of the story was it dawned on me one day while I was sitting there pumping with my doors locked and like in my office in that comfortable environment, I was like, what do all the other ladies do? I'm not the only mum here. Like, what are the others doing that don't have their own private office? So I went and spoke to a couple of the other mums. I was like, where do you, where do you pump? Like, how do you do it? Oh, we go to the toilet. Oh, we find an empty meeting room and da 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 da. I was like, what the fuck? That's not good enough. Like, why? So I contacted HR and I was like, why don't we have rooms where mums can breastfeed and express their milk and now every office in FIFA has a dedicated breastfeeding room with a fridge and a comfortable couch and a private area where mums can go and express and pump their milk how good is that eh Pat that's power used right is yeah. It? Yeah. yeah yeah let's get that shit out of it so. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though yeah yeah well I, I, yeah it just it kind and of Qatar, dawned, it kind of I, and me. this was the other thing I it, it it's not lost on me that I'm in this kind of very visible position and it's hard to be a working mum in football, especially in Switzerland. The way that the Swiss system is set up, where FIFA is based, it's not friendly towards working mothers. 
like even in primary school, for the two hours or one hour and a half of lunchtime, parents have to go pick their kids up from school and take them home for lunch. So you don't, the kids don't stay at school. So it's real hard to be a working mum because someone in the middle of their day has to go away from the office, the mum or the dad or whoever, go pick up the kids, bring them home to, to feed them lunch. So the whole system in Switzerland is set up to make it real hard to be a working mum. And in football, it's even harder because of the nature of what we do, especially if you're involved in tournaments and you're traveling and whatever. So in Qatar, like I, I came back to work in September and the World Cup in Qatar was kicking off in November. And Mark and Matisse came with me because I was still breastfeeding. And every single match that I went to at every stadium in Qatar, I took the baby with my baby bag and I was breastfeeding and expressing and I was in the VIP tribune with my baby and husband there because I knew that me being visible, having the baby, being seen to have the baby and still be operating in my capacity and my job was really, like, really important for me. Yeah. So, Ray, I reckon this is one of the most epic episodes we've done. <laughs> like, we've covered so much ground. It's, seriously, it's so impressive and you articulate and tell your story so well and it's full of empathy and authenticity. <laughs> and it's just, man, it's, it's been so cool. And we're so grateful of you giving us your time because we know this is the longest interview you've done and we know how valuable your time is. You know, you've got the whole woman's <laughs> world of football to look after. Um, but thank you for coming in. Thank you for stopping by and sharing this. Like people are going to get so much out of this and yeah I just really appreciate oh, it but. thank you so much thank you man me and Seamus go way back yeah we've got some yarns and some stories and I'm so proud of you and what you've achieved both of you guys and I've loved this honestly I feel more relaxed sitting here right now talking to you guys than I have for the last six months it's just been a lot of tense pressure stress anticipation and I feel so chilled now yeah thank you for this like this has been such a valuable moment for me just talking to you guys yeah that's so cool Shay you got an outro oh uh, yeah I'm gonna battle through this I think because nothing <laughs> personally makes me prouder than seeing someone from the Pacific succeeding on the world stage mm. and you combine that and the football element, which to me personally was my life for 10 years. Mm. And it's incredible to see what you are doing now, but also it's really easy to understand how you do it and why you do it because of your journey. And there's so much power in, in New Zealand and the Pacific and our ability. The world can learn a shit ton from our people. 100%. And I was amazed, and I'm going to steal words from one of your staff. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but mm -hmm. their summary of who you are is exactly my kind of take on, on who you are and hopefully what's come through in this episode. So these are their words. From my personal point and having worked closely with Sarai over a number of years, I can only tell you positives. She is authentic, loves what she does, cares about others, is smart, and has absolutely no attitude. Furthermore, she has an amazing leadership style with a good sense to feel people. Despite her top position in a global organisation and all the FIFA glamour, she never forgets about the people on the ground and how the power of football can be the voice for the ones with less opportunities and access to the game. To me, Sarai is more a friend than a boss. Aww. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, get me the tissues again. <laughs> <laughs> all the best for the remainder of the World Cup. It's going to be epic and you deserve... An amazing holiday, and uh, hopefully you enjoy that pay-per-view in Sydney and seeing your big brother go to work with uh, some other Kiwis that are doing amazing things on the world stage. Can't wait. It's going to be amazing. Thank you so much, you guys. Cheers, Sarah. Epic. <laughs>